me. I'm sorry, but we're now beginning a recording. Thank you, everyone. So some of the information here for fitness and agility actually came from uh, Tim Pedraza uh, speaking on fitness. He went to a specific trainer. He's having some low back trouble. And we've had back trouble with uh, back judges. And because we do so much backward running, twisting, and turning, it's normal to have some pain in your lower back. So the fitness we're able to do with that is to counterbalance. Everybody does their sit-ups, working their core. And sometimes we overwork the core and need to work the low back. So some of this uh, exercise should help the low back to make sure you confirm information, uh, stabilizing the low back to counter the, the strong abs that you're going to be working on. Plus, we do so much twisting and turning. So, for instance, when we do jogging, rather than just going out doing jogging, I know Gary Gittleson has taught me spinning around in the middle of a jog because how many times do we spin around on the football field? Perhaps going at angles, jogging some backwards, flipping around, running forwards. Uh, this position is prone to a lot of turning and twisting while you're on the football field and a lot of times at full speed. Uh, you might want to also turn and uh, do a side run. You might have to uh, turn your shoulders over and run toward a, a, a pylon. So we want to, want to counter uh, and balance that with our agility and running and balance uh, when we're running at a full speed and also in trotting speed. So this is just some information on reminding us to do some interchanging along with our backpedaling and training, uh, jogging forwards and sideways. Uh, some of the weight training you want to do, obviously, Everybody wants to look good, so we do our upper body, our back, and our arms, but we want to make sure we do our legs because nobody does more running backwards than the, the back judges. So make sure you exercise your legs and keep that uh, strength going as well. Uh, agility ladder, we end up on the website, uh, Steve had mentioned earlier on our San Diego County Football Officials.org. And under the back judge setting, there's some uh, training specific to a, an agility ladder, which is actually a ladder painted onto the under the floor or the football field or the uh, in the grass. And it's the ability of changing your, your, your feet, such as when you would see the football players doing agility, running through tires on the ground. It's the same type of exercise. You can come up with different abilities, uh, run right foot, left foot, left foot, left foot, right foot, changing up that, uh, perhaps going sideways and then turning and going forwards, doing knee high steps, uh, butt kickers, uh, you can do all that with an uh, uh, agility ladder, and that's often helpful in, uh, in your training. It's, so, um, we no longer talk about weight uh, in, in and of itself in terms of fitness. We, we actually use the term fitness now. So in order to be fit, um, it doesn't necessarily mean you can run six miles. Um, and my son, who is like John, an ex, uh, exercise uh, expert, a phys physical education expert, um, said, Dad, he's worried about my age. And he said, when you get older, you're not going to fall over because you can't run six miles. You're going to fall over because you can't start and stop. You can't turn. You can't spin. Your legs are weak. You're not strong in your upper body. You're not balanced. You're not carrying things. So when we talk about fitness and, and John says, get, get with somebody who can help you and set up a fitness training and tell them your goal is overall fitness. And then you can talk about um, your health in terms of diet and, uh, and, and your, um, you know, that, that element of fitness. So there's certainly weight is a component, but, uh, John's on the right track in terms of what we, we like to uh, talk about. So let me see if I can get to another slide here for some reason. There we go. Thank you, Steve. So obviously rule six is the back judge role, we want to know uh, all about kicks. So typically on our crews, everybody's assigned a role and typically rule six in our um, rule book is going to be assigned to the back judge. So obviously we refer quite often to our kicks. If anything's going to go wrong, any game it's going to be on a kick. Uh, I know Bob Bain had mentioned to me one time, whether it's a kickoff or punt, you just assume it's going to go sideways. And again, another thing Tim Pedraza had always taught us uh, plan for the worst and hope for the best. So I know that uh, Steve has instructed a lot of the line officials and Zach talked about last week, uh, pregame working at a pylon. So back judges might want to work on, uh, if you see the punts warming up, different types of punts, how punt returners are. Uh, film review is always important. So one thing I 
fast forward to on film is I want to pregame the uh, the kick return or the kickoffs or the kick return or the punt punt returners. So I get write down numbers of punt returners and get to know them. We'll talk later about communication with them. Uh, so I, I try and learn their tendencies. Like the referee often looks at a quarterback's tendencies. We want to look at kickers' tendencies. Um, who's the kickoff guy so you know who expect to uh, talk to. Maybe get to know if they're going to do specific kicks. If you've seen a pattern away they kick off in the past, if they do pooch kicks, they do do a lot of onsides. I know uh, Patrick Henry is going to onside every time. So expect the worst and hope for the best. Always uh, so in that pregame. Remember, this is, uh, it, the title of this slide is pregame checklist. And I'm going to hammer that home because um, all of this information that John is sharing with us uh, each official who is working the back judge position or maybe working the back judge position should have this information organized into a pregame checklist. And um, uh, we have an example of it on our uh, website from uh, uh, Scott Riley and the Big 12. Uh, and it's an example of the line judge. But each official should be very comprehensive in this checklist so that during the week, maybe, uh, maybe it's the Friday at work or during lunchtime. Sometime before you arrive at the, at the school, before getting dressed, before your pregame, on your own, at work, at, at lunchtime, you go through your pregame pre checklist and all these things that John's talking about. In the game itself, in the warmups, you certainly want to watch the uh, curvature of the kick um, and get a feel for a left or right fade on the kick, or does he drive the ball deep, or is he high and short? Um, and be prepared for the worst. Uh, instructional video this week shows a kick that is kind of high, coming down around the 20, hits on the point of the ball, and obviously, John, it immediately bounces straight for the goal line. So are you prepared for the worst, expecting the worst, and then reacting to the best, okay? Steve did a great presentation at the GNAC clinic a couple weeks ago on, on these checklists specific to uh, uh, particular games. and and position so that like Steve mentioned how that ball is checking off you want to check things in your pregame check it off make sure you've looked at and observed such things another uh, some of the other great officials who have taught us um, even not on the kicking game but receiving on passing who are the the so-called studs on the receivers the running backs coming through and blocking low or perhaps running pass and, and uh, running those nine routes on the side um, get your head in the game, and again, we'll uh, we'll work on that on our pregame checklist to go through and make sure we're prepared um, uh, mentally as well as physically before the game. Okay. So obviously, on the timing, we're going to be in charge of of uh, timing for the uh, play clock. And now, uh, our officials association has put on the checklist of having the timer on our belt, which is really helpful. So I always like to again. Obviously, we've been prepared with uh, certain batteries, and I timed that with timing that on the, looking at the clock. So I practice that, reaching back, resetting. I time my timer to make sure it's appropriate with the clock, the 25 second, the 40 second. Is everything timed correctly? I know what I'm, where I'm reaching, where I'm, where I'm uh, activating that machine. So that's also on my checklist to go through. Uh, the five and five axiom for the game, since all officials are responsible for the game clock, so we obviously want to be responsible as well for that. Uh, so we're going to be watching that game clock as well as the 25 second clock. It's all our babies. So we'll take care of that. But on the game clock, because it's uh, primarily a, a line judge in our high school mechanics, if I see a, an issue with the five on five axiom, and that would be if we have five minutes, we're under five minutes before each half or the end of the game, uh, we need to fix the clock. Well, we've had a uh, more than five second change prior to that five minutes. Again, we want to question the change. Again, I go to the line judge because the line judge is uh, the main person in charge of that before we go to the referee, we'll make a decision. So one person comes with the, the decision to come to the referee with the appropriate time to make sure we time that. Uh, so that's always important too. And dead ball clock changes we were going to do with, if there's a timeout, touchdown, what always helped me to help the other officials since we're on the uprights for the extra point I always say the time after the touchdown, I look at the clock, I say it out loud. If I say it out loud, I'm more likely to remember it, whether it's the umpire or the line judge back with me, have them repeat it back. So after that uh, extra point, we go for the kickoff, it should be that same time that we said to each other. So it's just another helpful hint that's always helped me. 
Uh, with the play clock summaries, as we mentioned, play clock and game clock timing mechanics. Uh, review your signals with the communication with the 25 second, whether they're going to reset. So we want to make sure we're going to reset to a 20, 25, or 40. Again, communicate with the crew and the referee to make sure you have eye contact and they visually uh, talked about it and shown each other. Yes, that's confirmed. I'll leave it up to the, some referees on our crews. They want to be in charge of, of resetting that. Now, I may suggest them if, I, if there's a play clock operator at your game. I would suggest that I'm only suggesting we reset, but the referee will give the final signal on that. So that's always good to get that communication prior to the game. Um, we want to have, uh, uh, and that would be also in your, uh, instruction or the line judges instruction to the, um, play to the, oh, they, we don't reset with a, a visible play clock. So no, never mind. My bad. No worries. Um, so oh, by the way, I want to tell everybody this PowerPoint, uh, was distributed, um, in the mass email that went out. And so everyone should have it, but again, we will also put it on the website. Another thing we like to do is we always, as the back judge, help our, our referees. So you're always going to be their back. You want to make sure everything shines for them and everything goes swell for them. So we want to be a back judge to help the referee facilitate the game. And one of those ways would be typical. Um, if they have their back to the play to the game clock, we want to make sure if we're looking at the game clock, the referee and I, the back judge, have communication. Hold off where you have some type of signal. You go into pregame. Hold off before you do the ready for play. If we're at 26 seconds, 27 seconds, hold off. And then once we're clear, we have a signal that we can go ahead and hit the ready for play. So we're cleared on that. So just those little caveats that help when you talk about before the game so that when it comes, it's it's ease uh, and you've talked about it. And umpires are on this crew tonight. They'll be doing the exact same thing, John, right? So, Absolutely. so yeah, they're facing like you are to the, to the, um, uh the, the game clock and it's down at 26 all we got to do is hold it just a second or two and so there ought to be two stop signs one from the back judge and one from the umpire there probably will on a great crew and so when we facilitate that appropriately the observers will notice there is no glitch in any type of uh, uh in, in that communication it ran smoothly and another thing about the back judge you know the, the line judge is going to take the clock that's moving Back judge is in charge of all the timing outside of that clock moving. So you can imagine we actually have more clock responsibility to keep us on time, keep us focused, keep everything game administration wise to keep it moving because the game clock is only what's moving. It's everything outside of that the back judge should be responsible for, such as we have in our slide is for the timeout. So we know we, we're going to make sure everybody's on time so we have appropriate uh, timeout or if after a score, we have that one minute time. So we're kicking off right at one minute. So we can have this example here with 30 seconds. So you have the O2O, there's no O2O. You have to make sure we have hand signals. Time that so the, the players right. come out off of their sidelines at an appropriate time. So again, we want to keep that game uh, administration moving. Uh, somebody's got their uh, microphone on. Uh, everyone should be muted but John, okay? Please. Thank you. Okay. So again, crew communication, you're essentially the O2O uh, for the rest of the crew. If you don't have the O2O, the back judge takes that opportunity to, to keep the, the crew communicating and go between the players, such as sideline to sideline and, and so forth. Um, we talk about um, between um, penalty information, if you see, uh, for example, uh, a coach having a problem with a, or an official having a problem with a coach, and say, if you have the opportunity to go between and help out, you can help facilitate that and keep moving in between. Um, so again, the old wives tell it's, it's the rocking chair position, but it really isn't because you have so many responsibilities outside of the game administration to keep everything timed appropriately. So you wanna make sure everything facilitated and uh, runs smoothly for the referee and the rest of the crew. Um, so again, as I mentioned, you wanna keep the time going on the kickoffs so that everybody's facilitated and we're ready to kick off right when we need to. And if the kickoff is scheduled for a certain time, you wanna make sure you do that as well. Um, another thing helping referees would be if you, uh, 
I know the line judge is going to speak to the clock operator, but if you happen to go along and who's beside the clock operator is typically as an announcer, if you know when the uh, national anthem is going to be played, is it on tape? Is someone singing? Is it a band? If you know that timing, because they'll have everything coordinated, you'll be able to refer that to the referee to help with the coin toss facilitation so that we can kick off on times. And so again, uh, the back judge would help facilitate the referee getting everything going on time. And, and this is like critical theme right here. If the back judge is really helping the referee, he's, a, he's like an assistant referee. I was fortunate enough to have Michael Mothershed as one of my back judges. Michael Mothershed's referee in the Big 12. When Michael was my back judge, I never had to worry about any of this. And I, I asked Michael, I said, Michael, I'm kind of a, I get in a bad mood if we're not on time. I am sure Bobby Kennedy gets in a bad mood if you're on on time. Um, and, and most referees are, they're very punctual. They want the game managed well. If I'm managing that, I, it gets me in a bad mood. But Michael Mothershed took all that off my shoulders. And John Downing would take that all off your shoulders. He would tell the crew, hey, we got five minutes till we got to hit the field. It takes us three minutes to walk. We got it two minutes. I don't have to worry about that. John's got my back. When it gets everybody organized for the coin toss, he's got my back. You know, John, is the time right for the, you know, the coin toss? Yes, that's the correct time. Be an assistant referee. Thanks, John. Steve. Yeah, Kel Evans helped me with that as well. And, and, and you've helped us keep everything administratively well. Something different in, in, uh, for observers is as simple as a uh, ball mechanics for the daisy chain. If, if you know your crew, if someone you know has short fingers or something, they may drop a ball. Perhaps uh, you know ahead of time a better way to toss the ball or get the ball facilitated. Obviously, for observers, we want to keep it off the ground. And um, particularly when it's a night game, if we have sun, if we have uh, lights, you want to, uh, again, be cognizant of any kind of uh, uh, ball or daisy chain or ball mechanics you can do with that. Just another thing to help the, the crew uh, facilitate the game. And again, the back judge can be the driver in the, of the conversation. doesn't have to be the referee. It's not always the referee trying to correct mistakes. Again, it's John Downing as the back judge saying, hey, I think we can do better next game on our, our daisy chain. There's some long incompletions on the sideline. I'm having to relay that all the way into the umpire. So let's get our flanks involved in the daisy chain. And then you make the correction. Referee doesn't have to get a, an attitude like we all do. <laughs> uh, so I think we can go on to penalty enforcement if it's okay, Steve, thank you. Uh, another issue uh, we would wanna bring up, I know uh, Don Carey has always helped us to make sure we cover flags. Everybody's involved in penalty enforcement. And one thing the, the back judge can do is cover flags. If you're not involved in the penalty, uh, definitely cover the flags, what they call up the middle. You, if an umpire has a flag down, you're going to cover that flag. If the referee has a flag down, particularly if it's a roughing the pass or uh, something long gains, uh, someone's got to go back and get that uh, referee's flag. So it's always good to have the back judge be the person to step up, cover that flag, and when, he, when the referee is ready to facilitate, you run back and have that flag ready. Another thing that was taught to me through the GNAC, uh, Mike Burton had taught us, is to, as a back judge come up and again facilitate the movement of the penalty enforcement. As soon as that flag is dropped, you go up, you verify with the uh, throwing official, is that the appropriate spot for the flag? If it is, you drop your flag on their flag, you pick theirs up, hand them to theirs. So when they go to the referee and then go off to do their duty after they talk to the referee. So if it's a flank, you go over and you're able to drop your flag on their spot, give their flag back, they, goes in, they go in, talk to the referee, perhaps get hacked, to talk to their coach and everybody's ready to go because you just stand as referee drop pick up your flag and you're back in your spot just another that, idea yeah that keeps that keeps us from throwing flags around <laughs> it does yes so again it looks real smooth it looks real clean um the only problem i ever had with that one time steve was an, an observer not any observers on here tonight but there was an observer i think somewhere that thought i was throwing a me too flag but it wasn't it was 
I was just dropping my flag to cover their flag, and I, did, I don't write anything. Well, I'll anything tell you as an observer, when I see a, a back judge covering flags and then helping by um, sharing flags like that, uh, that goes in my comments, because that's exemplary. That, because if that kind of detail from a back judge, I can only imagine what he's doing in his instruction with the rest of the crew. Yes, and it goes back to uh, timing everything out. So we're talking about penalty enforcement here and communication. That'll help facilitate that procedure and help get things going quicker and more and look much more efficient. So that's what we want to talk about there. Um, like I mentioned, grounding calls that the referee has to go a long distance. You want to make sure you go back, cover that flag and get that flag back to them uh, so they can facilitate as well. Um, Again, things such as kick out of bounds. If you're recording penalties, I always write down who the kicker is. If you're going, because that's the person that's going to commit the foul, kicking out of bounds. Just to, again, a heads up to keep things covered to facilitate your note taking on, on the penalties. Um, Part returners, we want to uh, signal review protection. Again, I'm going to talk to that uh, returner hopefully before the game because I already know who returns their punts, so I can talk to them. Um, perhaps you can facilitate even on kick returns. If you see on kick return film, you know they're kick returners, who's usually signaling that fair catch. Um, we can talk to them ahead of time to make it clear to them, we, our goal is to protect them. So we wanna make sure we practice and we know what particular uh, events they have, if they've ever thrown a, or ever put up a, a, an invalid signal, uh, we wanna make sure we explain the rule to them so it doesn't happen in your game. Again, Do you ask them to, to show you their issues. signal? Do you ask them to show show, show you their signal I in do. the pregame? Yes, I do. Particularly in uh, in in day games, Steve, I find it easier if they're going to shade their eyes. I know that again. I know they're shading their eyes, and we've had that communication. Good. And again, it goes back to just like if you see a good tackle, you communicate with the player. Hey, great job on that tackle. Same thing. They do a great communication before they toss me the ball running off the field. I say, hey, that was an awesome fair catch signal. Keep it up. Great job. So. Again, as you always tell us that when you come to coaches, come with good information, same thing with the players. If you see them doing good, great signal, I let them know. So I know that they know that we're watching them and we, we're gonna protect them and reward them for good behavior. Ready? Yes, sir, we can go to confidence, please. So as mentioned in the, in the slide, we wanna be a good, on the field and what that means is your first uh, experience with a coach or even a player um, you want to show them hustle you want to show them confidence walk with confidence we want to uh, uh, we want to run but but don't overrun don't over hurry uh, as soon as we come in to shake a, a coach's hand we're going to make sure we're present give eye contact same thing with the players we want to show exude confidence to them so they uh, know right offhand uh, the impression they're going to get for an official as a back judge. Um, there were different sayings we put in the slide here. Is uh, it, it was an easy game. Well, no, no game's really easy. I mean, you always want to work on something. Everything goes according to you want. That's great, but that's probably not going to happen. So there's always something to work on. We want to work uh, the best game we can, but there's always room for improvement. Um, we want it to run smoothly. And again, working in crews really helps out to run smoothly, facilitating. Um, so one of the comments as an observer that I will make is um, I'll characterize the game for the crew and for the conference supervisor or the assigner. And so I might say, um, that was an easy game. And I take your uh, uh, comments uh, seriously and to heart and agree with what you're saying. There is no such thing as an easy game. But what I'm saying is that from a spectator and observer viewpoint, that was an easy game. And then my second sentence is going to be, we hope, and you didn't make it a difficult game. You didn't insert yourself. You didn't start calling flags or penalties. There weren't phantom flags. You didn't get into it with the coaches. You kept it an easy game. It ended, you, it was a game that needed to end and you let it end. And you'll talk about that in later, uh, uh, John. Um, so a great comment would be, this is an easy game that you let be easy. Uh, through hard work, of course. Uh, another comment is it was a challenging and difficult game. But once again, you had the same effort. You were still working hard. 
Um, but you kept up with the game. You kept on top of the players. You kept on top of the communication with the coaches. So it was a very difficult and challenging game, and you handled it well. So that would be an observer comment. Yes, thank you, Steve. And, and with our confidence, as Steve has mentioned before and Don Carey has mentioned, the referee is the crew chief, but the back judge runs, helps run the crew, so the crew chief can be a, uh, the referee can be the crew chief. So other things on, on areas of the crew that you want to communicate and keep their confidence in, if you see any uh, another official is is struggling or is, is not sure of a call, um, make sure you're, you're positive. You know, talk them through it, make them understand. And, and you got it. You're only as good as your last call, so you have to bring them around. Uh, for instance, um, if, if someone makes an error, and we've all made errors, uh, I, it's always good if the back judge can go to that and help them along because you can't lose a crew member in the middle of the game. So you want to be uh, on top of that so the referee can go ahead and continue with what they're doing, but you can be there to help guide that official if there's a, if an example that you need to uh, help them along and be positive and uh, you want in the, the whole crew to function well. And in the same tone, in the next bullet, you can also help with the focus and concentration during big times. Like um, the first three minutes of a game are not that big a deal. I mean, everybody's focused. But what about the last five minutes of the half? I mean, that's critical crunch time. And so it's a good time for the back judge to step up and say, hey, guys, here we go. Five minutes. Let's focus and concentrate. Just kind of a reset, if you will. Um, over time, absolutely, the referee is going to reset there at the beginning. But as you're getting close to overtime, that's, again, where the back judge can say, hey, it's game time right now. So um, um, that's a good reminder. It is. And in such a simple situation as your, your game preparation on game film, uh, Don, is always, Don Carey has always been instrumental. Uh, Garth D. Police in film review. You've got to review your film. And if you've looked, at, if they have a quick kick, you might end up uh, making the crew aware, hey, this might be the situation where the, where the quick, quick kick came, may come in. You don't want to be caught with your, uh, your feet flat. Um, so again, instances like that, if, you have a, if you've seen film where they, this is a chance they may pooch kick, they may onside, um, there may be something funny on the, on the punts. Um, you know football and you've looked at their film, this might be a situation where they're going to run that, that nine pattern. They're going to go deep. So get everybody on the same on the same page. So thinking what you've seen in film and help guide them along because you want to make sure your pass coverage is appropriate. So again, whistle control, we talk about that in all positions, but the back judge is not a lot of opportunities you're going to blow your whistle. Uh, the play will kill itself a lot of times. Uh, perhaps uh, there's a fair catch. You may blow your whistle there and come in and, and kill the play immediately. Um, and again, if there's that fair catch, it, it's invalid or so forth. Come in and kill the play. Um, don't let anything uh, get out of hand in the play in the game. If you've seen they've been uh, they've been a little pushy, a little sloppy. Um, you may anticipate on that punt there may be a, a cheap shot. You may want to come in. So keep uh, aware of it and keep in there in the within the players and let the players separate, the colors separate, but uh, make sure you uh, are in charge of killing the play, whether it's with your voice or the whistle, but you wanna be aware of those situations. Um, you wanna be that great, great dead ball official. Um, again, if you've been able to, to know your history with that team, if there's any particular players that maybe, uh, we talk about uh, communicating with other crews and we may take talk a little bit about this later. We know the upcoming games coming up, and we all know what crews are, have worked those previous games. I know in the GNUC, we we the back judges get together and talk about situations, particular teams, situations they've they've uh, had situations. It really helps us quell things quickly. And the more information you have, information and knowledge is just very powerful. So that's always good to help. Um, we mentioned the ball mechanics, uh, be an athlete, throw strikes, preparation there. The ball secondary responsibility, um, make sure you, uh, you you get the old ball out. So it's always important. Again, we talk about game facilitation. So after a punt, if a punt is at a hash, or I'm going to place the ball uh, on the hash, I always tell the referee, 
the old ball. We, we always get the old ball out and I put it outside the hash so that when the umpire comes in with the new ball, they know they can place squarely right on that hash. The old ball's out of the way. Once that new ball is down, I can facilitate getting that old ball out. And what that does, John, is it uh, with the back judge taking responsibility for the old ball, the line judge or head linesman can uh, take the responsibility of the new ball. So they can focus on, does the quarterback standing with the ball back with the coach at the sideline? Then that, that flank has to get that new ball in. And otherwise, he's going to have an ornery umpire. So the umpire is going to be uh, critically involved in uh, ball mechanics, but the back judge is the guy who makes it all work. So work as a team. Absolutely. And um, another thing with communication is in seeing the ball, I know Mike Carey has always quoted, find the window. So I know we work with angles in facilitating a pass play. If I'm looking for a, a pass, pass to come down, what Mike says, look for the open window, get an angle where you can best see the play. And um, and again, it's it's all preparation and how you line up with that pass receiver. Okay. We got to kind of pick up the pace if we're going to uh, make it through the slides. So here we go. Oop, hold on. There we go. So obviously, uh, Scott uh, Riley the other night spoke about the five C's, very important. We, we do go through our five C's with concentrate, communicate, cooperation, and common sense with consistency. Um, there's just a, a different quotes throughout the uh, different officials through the years who've gone on great, much better things and higher things than, than I ever hoped to, uh, to achieve. And these are just some of the quotes that you can go back through the slides and pull out. And uh, it's just good sayings to uh, live from others. And also, you, you can quote, uh, take a snippet of, of this, um, whatever part of this you want. You can divide it into your season and you can have a thought for each game. So with back judge, we want to make sure... Uh, we can back up the, the referee, uh, the, the illegal touching. If we see touchings for uh, any kind of passes, uh, they would help facilitate our communication with the penalties. Uh, the incomplete passes, we wanna make sure we have that clear signal. Um, signal 12 up there is an inverted whistle and make sure we help uh, cover any kind of uh, unusual signals. As Steve has mentioned, we're the backup referees who so wanna make sure we cover anything that would normally be covered in their, in their protocol. Um, we end up uh, with normal situations, scrimmage plays, uh, make sure you uh, get in and break up the huddles, or if you know there's no huddle, you know you can help the, uh, the crew, our crew, work and facilitate, hey, I know they're going to run a no huddle in this situation. They're going to break fast. We want to make sure we're in position so that we can better officiate the game. Um, the hurry up offense is the two minute warning or the two minute uh, Offenses, we want to make sure we do a signal. We know that it's going to use a single ball because it's going to be a, a fast pace uh, offense. Um, kickers, returners, we mentioned that. We want to speak with all of them. Dead ball plays, um, outside the numbers, plays inside the numbers. Make sure we cover. Um, like The referee is always going to follow the quarterback. Well, we want to make sure we go sideline to sideline. If there's plays out of bounds, we follow straight out of bounds and get those walk those players out if they're in the opposing sideline. Uh, your goal line mechanics, again, Tim Pedraza helps us out. Find a line practicing your pregame, whether it's the sideline, the true sideline, the five-yard line, the 10-yard line, wherever their players are warming up, find a line because we're responsible for the end line. It's going to make sure we uh, visualize anything that could happen in an end line or a sideline. That's a critical uh, uh, pregame warm-up skill um, that should be practiced by every official that has uh, past responsibilities. Um, uh, catch, no catch, inbounds, out of bounds. And we are, we, you know, our philosophy is, is uh, feet ball, right? Feet ball, feet first, then ball. You want to see it all, but you, you got to start with making sure you can see the feet and the ball. So any line will work. So when they're running uh, uh, defensive back drills or receiver bill, all you want is somebody catching a ball near a line, whether the line goes horizontal or vertical, doesn't matter. Um, and so you can practice that vision pattern. I also wanted to go back up to the hurry up offense and the two minute offense. When uh, 
when John gives that signal that, hey, they're going to go fast, we're hurrying up, we also have to now be challenged by one, this is critical time, reset, mentally reset. Also, we can't make a mistake. So we have to be very disciplined in what we do. Our tempo has to be very purposeful. It's now, we're not, we, it's not the time to be flying all over the place. It's the time to be purposeful and accurate because we're inside the two minute offense, which could be at four minutes. But when John gives that signal, then all those things are gonna happen. We're gonna be very disciplined. We're gonna be making sure we make no errors. That means penalty enforcement has to be correct and has to be efficient. There's no errors and we have to be ready for their hurry up tempo, okay? The other thing, Steve, it was taught by me again by somebody else, Chris Quake taught me when he was a back judge, not only the line that, that Tim Pedraza taught us, but as you watch a pass, again, we wanna watch catch, no catch. And Chris Coit taught me to watch the, the uh, stitching on the ball. If when it comes in, you think to your pass in your head, was the, were the stitching in the ball up? Was it down? Was it side? That'll help show movement of the ball. So if you know you're concentrating on where the white stitching on the ball is when they catch it, you're concentrating on movement of the ball. So that was always good as a, as a, a, a trick for my brain to think when I see a ball come in and catch by a receiver in warmups, I'm thinking, okay, I saw the stripes, the, the stitching of the ball was on top that time, or it was on the bottom, or it was on the side. And I go through a drill trying to see, so I'm concentrating, and that'll help me to visualize catching of the ball, did the ball move once it hit the receiver's hand. Okay, so those way. two plays where that's gonna come into play, one's gonna be a trap ball or a catch just off the grass. So if you can be looking through there and watching the uh, seam of the ball and whether it moves, uh, or he plucks that thing before it hits the grass. And the other is, does the ball move after he's catching the ball and going to the ground? Does he continue to control the ball? All right, don't get beat deep. <laughs> Definitely. It's a fine line. You want to make sure you're deep enough, but you don't want to get deep, beat deep and uh, cover all lines. Take yourself. In the instructional video in advertising for tonight's session, the guy ran, uh, it was a fourth down and I want to say 15, and they ran a seam route from the back and he got back past the uh, back judge into the middle of the uh, end zone and the end line could have been threatened. It was overthrown, but if it had been thrown right on the button, he could have been right at the end line and the back judge couldn't have gotten there. So um, when, when in question, keep going, keep going. It is tough. And we talked about Steve, as you know, at the GNAC clinic, the, uh, the, the back judge is sole responsibility to the end line. I know there's the goal line that's very important, but you are the only one at the end line. So very important if the ball gets popped out running to the, to the goal line and it gets toward that end line, it's your responsibility. So always be aware, I have to get to that end line. When in question, go to the end line. Yep, yep. Um, as mentioned here with dead ball fishing, we go over that many times, never too much. Uh, two flags, so two flag situation for a back judge might be on a punt return. So if, if you have a flag and the, and the side official, the flank official has a flag, a lot of times uh, your flag might become their flag, such as a block in the back or a hold or, or targeting might be important. So if, if they ended up, it was a block in the back, but you're throwing for a, a kick catch interference, again, we communicate. If we communicate that the block in the back caused the foul, your foul, your flag becomes their flag. We put it together and one of them would communicate. So again, we communicate that pregame with the uh, flank official. So if that situation comes up, we can facilitate much, much faster. Um, so other flags, more than one flag, we always talk about PI. Um, we come together again, communicate that there's two flags, two flags becomes one flag. A lot of times the flank official will go back and report the pass interference and you can cover the flags. And again, they take their flag with them so that you can help them facilitate information to their sideline on what the foul was and how it was committed. Um, again, we, we talk about, we hurry, but we, we rush, but we don't hurry too much. Um, see the ball, player of possession when the ball is, play is over. So a lot of times the mistakes have been made during a, a punt return. So if it's fair caught, uh, we make sure we get in the practice of making sure it's, cons uh, uh, the player possesses the ball prior to blowing the whistle. Um, and by the sorry, way, I, anybody on this call, there is a question on the mechanics exam that John just answered. So <laughs> we, 
When say it again, John. When it comes to possession of the ball, do you go fast or slow? <laughs> slow. Slow down. Absolutely confirm con confirmed possess, uh, possession of the ball before killing the play. So absolutely go slow. Then come out strong. Absolutely, come out strong. You want to make sure everybody knows on the field you've sold the call. Okay. So again, we talk about um, being aware of kicks and the field goals of PATs. Help the crew out, know ahead of time in, in our mechanics when the back or when the umpire comes back with you or when the flank official comes back with you. Help the crew communicate that. Be thinking ahead of time to help facilitate that movement. It can get awkward at times, but if someone takes charge of always telling them, I, I've got this, and you're helping facilitate who's back with you, that helps a lot. And you and on, that position. On the instructional video this week, you'll see a play, it's a field goal, and uh, one of the flanks doesn't know if he's underneath or not, and uh, the back judge, who I think is Chris Wiggins, <laughs> from, uh, really? center judge from the Pac-12, happened to be filling in. And he, and he was shooing the guy, you know, back to his position. So take the lead. Again, you are like an assistant referee back there. Absolutely. It makes the crew really look good. And that's your, that's your goal is the crew to look good. So you want to make sure we take control of that. And again, your clear whistles on the, on the kicks through the uprights. Again, it's, it's a line. The, the upright is a line. It's the crossbar is a line. It's not a plane. So we know that from rule six. Um, we make sure with the, on the long field goals, if they're faking it, if you know, for instance, from your, your play review and film, if they fake this game, this play a lot, you're telling the other official we're going pylons or for, we're going to do situations that you've seen them in the past. Be ahead of the game and know what to, what to expect and always expect the worst and hope for the best. Uh, again, if they're faking their field goals or faking their PATs, you're well aware of that and you bring the crew up to, up to speed on that. If they have good kickers, poor kickers, wind conditions, um, your preparation really helps with that. If if a team is, has been known to run back a, a long field goal or uh, come out and somehow fair catch in the middle, um, just visualize it happening. So if it does happen, you've got it covered and it doesn't surprise you. Um, hideout plays, same thing. We've seen guys come out of nowhere from, from hideout plays. So again, any information you can supply from knowledge from previous games really helps and goes a long way. I think we go to the next slide, Chief. Okay. Um, so these are again, some of the uh, routines, concentration routines in different situations. And again, these have been passed down by some great officials and you take it whatever you want, add and subtract whatever you want and any kind of information you can add in between. But these are just ones that I've used in the past before the kick, on a kickoff, these this would be my routine to know and repeat over and over. And we'll go through. We can go through the different ones, on Steve. Yeah, get those teams out. Get them ready to go for a um, kickoff. Uh, there's, you know, they're going to kick it to the right or they're going to kick it to the left. So just get them out. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Get your counts ready. Get the facilitating so you know what officials um, when we're ready for a count, so the referee can look good and getting that ball ready for play. So it's ready and this play. year we have, uh, John, we have the National uh, Federation mechanic for a free kick. Uh, everybody else has been using it that's probably on this call uh, that's not from San Diego. So the back judge is going to present the ball. Do not throw the ball to the um, kicker. Present the ball after instructing him to wait for the whistle before he goes, and then turn and run till you get to what? About the numbers or below the numbers and then turn? And again, that's a that's a place where we can really shine because you want to get that facilitated. So the faster you sprint, and again, the, the observers are watching, you're sprinting into that position. Of, you know, after you get to the numbers, you flip around. There's an opportunity to go from front to back pedaling and get our arm ready, and we're ready to go. So that, that really looks sharp when you can nail that. Then you got your hand up in the air to the referee. Um, don't need to look at the referee or get his, you know, he's looking for you. So and, and another thing we used on that mechanic, Steve, that you mentioned, because we'd used it in the GNAC, when I'm at the center before I run off, I give a thumbs up to my flank officials to make sure they're they're ready as well. So I can go ahead and run to the sideline. So I know Absolutely. I've already checked them off. So when I'm under the sideline, my hand is up and I know they've already cleared. Good. Know your colors, anticipate onside kick every time. 
that was one Every that Bob, Bob Bain really preached a lot. I mean, it saved me a lot. Just, just thinking, you know, you're being bag in your hand, assume it's going to be an onside kick. It's kicked away. Then you're, you're free and clear. You know, these guys haven't played a regular season. They're going to come out in the first non-league game. Everybody's excited. There's may, hopefully no COVID protocols. Why wouldn't you try an onside kick opening kickoff, right? Absolutely. Right. And I think I had that, uh, JT Sullivan in his first game as a high school coach when he was at Patrick Henry and that's when we found out oh he's going on site every time so yeah that was a good game to start with yeah okay after the kick okay after the kick we're going to transition we're going to make sure we watch that 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 if they're on side kicks um, who has ball who has illegal kicks so if it's going to whether it's going to or you're watching the ball we want to make sure we've already pre-planned Who's watching what if if the kick if we have an illegal block going into the kickoff? Um, you know your ten yard marks obviously, and you've had that in your head. I know Zach talked about how he memorized his ten yards for the chains. Well, we want to memorize obviously it's gone ten yards and the ball hasn't gone ten yards when we throw our beanbag. So also again in throwing your beanbag on a first touching on the kickoff, um, if it slides at the the beanbag slide you make sure it's within the 10 yards it wouldn't look good to beanbag beyond 10 yards just to help uh, remember which what your positions is um, so you're aware of the onside kick uh, the ball is kicked away you're looking helping to look for the the illegal blocks and if it's kicked toward you you're going to have the ball so just again to help to facilitate if it happens you're ready and prepared okay we have um Seven more slides uh, and about seven more minutes. So <laughs> here we go. We got this. So obviously uh, we've, chalked, we've talked earlier about clock status because after the kickoff, we've communicated with the official underneath us. We verbally communicated when the uh, kickoff was scored. So we know there's not been any kind of movement on the clock. Um, that's what the clock status. The ball mechanics possibly needing to replay the ball on the other side of the field. We get the old ball out, new ball in. Uh, we're going to move scrimmage play positions. Um, anticipate the play. First and ten could be any play, but if it's third and long, then anticipate uh, anticipate pass. And the penalties may need to get to, to the head coach. You want to be the co-between between the flank official. Kick out of bounds, something like that. You might be uh, in proximity to the coach, and they you may be able to say what yard line he wants it on the 35 or what position he wants it if it's a touchback. Again, you're going to establish your your depth position on the field and, again, have a, a, a landmark. Uh, Gary Gittleson was really good about always finding not only a, a landmark or where you are in the field. Uh, someone might ask, how do you know you're, where you're on the field? Just Always remember the position where you're at. So if you turn and run, you've counted lines below you uh, just to help facilitate and position yourself on the field. Um, confirm the clock status. Always have eye contact with the referee throughout the situation. They're looking at many things, looking at substitutes. You want to maintain your position laterally with the referee so you can maintain eye contact and confirm uh, when the play clock is going to start and if we need to reset. Um, you're going to count with uh, the line judge in, in our mechanics for the for San Diego, we're going to confirm whether we have 11, whether we ha we're, a, we're we're going to recount um, if we have too many. So we're going to make sure uh, we confirm that ahead of time. So we communicate outside of the O2O because once they've broken the huddle, we don't want to uh, communicate in the O2O too close to the snap. Um, so obviously we're counting the, the B players um, cognizant of, of uh, substitutes coming and going. Um, identifying the coverage, um, whether you're going to cover tight or whether you're going to cover loose. If there's a, a snapshot situation, make sure the flank officials understand the snapshot of when that uh, player is in position for a, uh, a motion. If they're within the tackles, whether they're going to take that particular player on a play or whether you're going to take it, um, communicate ahead of time for their snap count for who's covering what receivers. Um, again, focusing on the, the formations, um, know ahead of time from your game film review, uh, get in proper positions, see the action on the keys, proper angles, uh, maybe communicate with O2Os or go to that official if you've switched, if you've made a switch and you want to make sure you communicate that as well. 
And 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 take the if you uh, have played the game before, take responsibility to scout the um, opponents, uh, and and find out are they playing man or are they playing zone coverage. Uh, it it means a lot to the uh, uh, our coverage of the passing game to know whether a defense is going to run up and and crowd and get in a uh, press coverage and run bump and run all night long, at which point you've got to be, you know, the flanks have got to be tending to the widest receiver from the get-go, and the back judge has to help with that, or do they run a lot of uh, zone, at which point we can be helping out with other things rather than worrying about the receiver getting off the line of scrimmage. And that number seven there, Steve, Donald Carey has been outstanding with helping officials, uh, back judges line up laterally. Always be cognizant of where the uprights are. You should never be able to position outside of your uprights. So always be aware of the position of the uprights and where your position is on yeah. the field. That always helpful. Good. So scrimmage plays on the count. This is our, our checkoff list when we're pre-snap. Um, you want to make sure you watch uh, action on the on your keys. Uh, Garth B. Police has done excellent when much of our zones. Our zones are so important for picking up blocks outside the zone and lead blocks and behind the zone as well. Um, very important we do that. We're looking at short passes, long passes, inside out coverage. Um, again, Steve mentioned football. So we communicate with the flank official toward the side. We get the inside out look and that really helps them communicate. And again, we talk about going slow. If there's a play, they'll look in at us. We look in at them. We make a decision whether it's good or no good. So it's always good to go slow there. We're looking for the crackback blocks. We talk about blindside blocks. So it's so many blocks at the second level that the back judge is key in really picking up the block on the linebackers. That's really important. Um, any holding or interference, we want to make sure we can uh, identify and put it, place it in a category. Um, don't guard errors, particular to the back judge. Don't back out too much on the long passes or short passes. So, um, players or who's going to foul who's not going to foul if you're beat you're, if you're beat you're going to cheat so anticipate situations such as that uh, when to talk to a player when to call throw the flag <clears throat> important situations you don't want to be too ticky tack but you want to educate um, don't leave your key when you're threatened particularly if you're in the in the, the red zone uh, we want to communicate with the officials. I'm not going to lose. I'm not going to change in that situation because we're in the zone. Uh, we want to make sure we clear our key a little bit longer. And we want to, again, whatever line is threatened, we're going to anticipate uh, ball in the air. We're going to go to the ball. The point of attack, make sure we watch watch players and not the ball and make sure we do dead ball officiate. Okay, so remember, we go man, ball, zone, or, uh, zone excuse me, man, zone, ball. So we start with our initial key if he's pressed and can't get off the line of scrimmage or, uh, uh, you know, we're worried about him at getting through the um, um, getting by the linebackers and not getting held. So that's that's man. Then we're going to go to zone because now we're identifying the routes. Are they running a seam route? Are they running layered routes? Are they running a vertical route that should develop and you should be able to be aware of it. And then finally, we're all going to the ball. And um, I also want to go back to the run. If you, if you as a back judge, so that's your, that's your progression for uh, reading pass. If you read run, then I want your eyes to go. If, if you have a tight end who happens to be your initial key, that's fine. But as soon as the run starts, if they are not going to your tight end side, I want your eyes to go to the linebackers. We want second level help. We want to know who's coming away from the line of scrimmage and into that second level to the linebackers. So when you um, so the back judge has an additional opportunity to help with the run game by viewing the linebackers. Then as the ball starts to get to the outside, you can move away from that again, just as, as John said, if the player is free of foul and isn't looks like he's not going to be fouled. Keep your eyes moving till you get out in front of the ball. But that's your progression. Okay, four to go. And so after the play initiates, dead ball officiate again, goes back to the top. We start from there. And you want to box into play, as mentioned. Uh, your inside out view is very important. Follow players. And as always mentioned by the Carey brothers, let 
players, let the colors separate. So we're gonna make sure we don't worry about the ball. Watch your colors separate. Once that's approved, then we can facilitate some uh, do ball mechanics. And again, we wanna move and hustle into the zone, side zone, protect players, uh, particularly if players cross uh, colors and go into the side zone, we walk them out just like a referee would do the quarterback. Um, always check your clock status, help the crew with that. Um, we're gonna reset any corrections as we mentioned the five and five axiom, confirm the down. We wanna make sure if you're not sure of the down, shut it down, make sure we communicate. We're fortunate with O2Os to help facilitate that as well. We we'll move to the position and again, we go to top of the key. Uh, so again, on a punt play situation, we're gonna set up in our position. You wanna be uh, angled at a particular position again, uh, you want to be able to see the ball and I've talked with other back judges and we come up with ideas on what works best for them and what works best for me and how we could help each other with seeing a ball coming down. You don't want to get too far up but anticipate the worst with the ball shooting through and going back to the goal line. So you want to be at an angle that you can still see the ball at the same time whether it's a the, if you see in film the ball come in to the left hand or the right hand with the right hand or left hand and again in San Diego, we set up on the chain side. So we wanna make sure we are at an angle that we can anticipate where that ball is gonna go, see the ball and see possession. Um, and if you're again, squeezed on that chain that. side, you have the op option to flip over as, because we want you to stay between the goalposts, as John said. So in order to stay and have that good angle, you may have to flip over to the line judge side. I love that. I was glad the mechanic committee was able to come in and realign that to have that option because sometimes yeah. that can really bail out a crew. So it's yeah. awesome to see. Um, we want to see, um, confirm the clock status again. Again, clock, clock, clock. Know the, if the clock is going to start on the snap. Again, an O2O really helps because I like a flank official to reconfirm to me because I know they're busy getting the ball in, watching players and reconfirm to the referee. So that you're on the same page as them. Hey, are we, we out of bounds or are we going to line? So we confirm, so when the referee looks at you, you've confirmed with them and we're all on the same page. That's always helpful to know. Um, conditions with the beanbag in hand, uh, you're obviously ready for the uh, react if you see uh, the end of the kick, um, know the spot. And again, you're gonna be the umpire and referee's best friend if you and can anticipate putting it on an even line should there be a penalty inside the zone uh, to help facilitate movement of the ball. Um, just imagine you you have punts and you're in the red zone and you drop that beanbag. It, it, it's a lot to think about, but a practice to maybe put it on an even line if it helps out. Um, mm -hmm. And then again, at the of, end, visualize the worst interference with the opportunity. Um, so uh, expect the worst. Expect that the, catch, the receiver will not catch the ball. I used to just say it over and over. The colors were really important to me. Um, that way I could go up and uh, with confidence say receiving team uh, fouled or the kicking team fouled. Um, so I knew the colors. I would say uh, catch my fumble, catch my fumble, catch my fumble. Because I had to know that, you know, I was going to officiate those three things differently. And then expect interference. Don't ex expect him not to catch the ball. Even if he signaled fair catch and there's nobody around. Absolutely. Um, at the snap on the punts, we're going to be aware of the the, uh, the fake punt. We'll be aware if they pass instead of kick. Um, we want to rotate uh, necessary prevention um, into the side zones. 100% ball responsibility. And again, we're going to transition. Once they retain possession of the ball, we're going to switch. We're going to watch that runner and watch the blocks as well. So it's, it's a good transition to make. Um, we're going to give them everything they've earned of momentum. Uh, be be aware if there's a kick inside the five. Again, transition to thinking it, it could be a momentum. You're ready for it if it happens. Um, so it's, it's always good practice to practice that as well. Uh, you're going to ready play, react. Officials uh, officiate the play as it happens and go from there. After John, the play, um, real real important here. So now you've officiated this kick. You've expected the worst, but the best happens. So he does, in fact, catch the punt, and he's on his return. Uh, when do you give up progress? I mean, almost immediately, right? Yes, that's going to be a flank official takeover from that. And again, it's called a transition. We want to communicate ahead of time what I consider transition of possession. 
and then I'm going to look for blocks and we're going to transition into the, the block so, mode. So back judges, as much as all that good stuff has happened, you have to immediately transition to blocks. Because you have no no forward progress responsibilities. So, okay. After the play, after the play again, we emphasize the ball officiating. We want to make sure we let the colors separate. We're going to cl check clock status because that's a crew responsibility, and we're going to reset any corrections in the five and five action as we're back into that. The uh, signaling for the timeout and the direction for the touchback. Um, good strong signals. You want to make sure you have good strong signals for the for the referee and the, the crew so they understand what's going on. We have signal um, the illegal touching position, if appropriate, if we have um, uh, advised the referee if necessary, the situation why we didn't have the PI, if they made means make an announcement, but they need to know why we didn't have the PI if we had a, a touch situation. Um, we confirm, confirm the down and the distance in our heads so we can make sure um, when the first downs are, are coming. Uh, move to the proper position for the next play and we transition into the next sequence. The comments were very, um, uh, they loved your comment, John, about back judges, you're responsible for the clock when the clock is not moving. You are, you've got to know what the status of the clock is when it's not moving. When the clock's moving, then everybody's responsible for killing the clock, right? So really well thought. Last, last slide, John. All right, great. Uh, so we're doing the, the PATs and the field goals before the snap. We're going to set up in our position. We're in the un, under the appropriate uh, upright. We've we've moved the other official into the position. We're going to count our D, our B players, make sure there's any kind of substitutions going on, confirm that information. Uh, we're going to note fourth down uh, if there's any attempt uh, for the field goal attempt. If we know they're going to kick field goal, if they don't have a kicker, we've already transitioned into that. Um, that's communication the eligibility of the receivers and the numbers. And again, it's really important. It, I'm not that smart, as Tim Madraza would say, I'm not that smart. So it's easier for me to remember the uh, inappropriate numbers than it is for the, a lot of times it's the snapper has the inappropriate number and we don't have to worry about the four numbers on the outside. But again, we've transitioned to that into crew communication prior to what numbers I'm giving them. So if anything breaks down, we've communicated who's an eligible receiver, who's in, ineligible in that position. So once the snap, uh, we're going to be aware of the PAT and the field goal, good or bad, the ball's alive, uh, missed field goals, goals, uh, goals kicked, et cetera. We're going to rule on the, the success or failure, make sure we've communicated prior to the uh, game with the referee how long I'm going to hold my signal and whether I'm going to hold it here and if they know if the kick was successful or unsuccessful. So make sure they know that information. So it doesn't look awkward. A good tempo with rolling signalings. We talk, we say good, good, no, no. Um, yes, yes, no, no, uh, as opposed to good and no good because it could transition into miscommunication. So if we say yes, yes for good and no, no for no good, uh, that works out better. And again, prior to- Hold that signal till the referee sees you because he may be busy with a couple of knuckleheads back there and hasn't had an opportunity to check whether it's good or not. And he may have a foul and needs to know what, what's going on. So hold your hold your signal until you get eye contact with the referee. And again, on timing, we, uh, we've communicated with other back judge. When do you start your clock for the one minute after a score? I never thought about it, but as soon as that kick is good or no kick, I start my clock for one minute. So I know the transition to the kickoff should time up to one minute from that point. So after the play, we're gonna again, dead ball officiate is always at the top. Check the clock status, that's always at the top. Reset any corrections under the five and five axiom. The score was confirmed, uh, the down and distance again, communicate with the outside officials. Uh, success for the kick, uh, start the dead ball officiating with the kickoff on the referee's whistle, we're in position, keep the crew communicating and move to the position of the next play in the scrimmage play with a kickoff. John, that was outstanding. I, I encourage everyone who is a back judge or aspiring to be a back judge to take, oh, my lights just went out, um, to take um, to take that information and put it into your pregame or midweek checklist. And, um, and, and, and that you will be a, you will have a comprehensive preparation list that you can focus on and uh, bring it, bring your best to the crew and to the game that week. Uh, John Downing, on behalf of San Diego, I know Los Padres was in the house. 
Um, and all the officials, we had another 90 something, close to 100 officials on this call. Uh, thank you, John. We appreciate what you're giving back uh, to our association. And we'll see you out on the field in San Diego too. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. And thank you, Steve. I appreciate it very much. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.